The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 12968 in the name of Patricia Ferguson on the importance of recognising the condition Barrett's Osphagus. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who want to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. Members leaving the chamber should do so quietly. I call on Patricia Ferguson to open the debate seven minutes or so, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And may I also thank members across the chamber who have supported the motion we are debating this evening. Presiding Officer, I want to tell you this evening about the experiences of two men which I hope will help to highlight why this short debate is so important. A few years ago, a friend of mine, Dave Scott, who then worked with my husband, former MSP Bill Butler, became ill. Dave didn't talk much about it, but it was obvious that something was seriously wrong. Over what seemed like a very short period of time, Dave lost weight. In fact, he lost a lot of weight. He lost half of his body weight and seemed literally to be wasting away. And through most of this time, Dave continued to work. So it was very obvious to us all. And the worst thing was that he didn't know what was wrong. He couldn't swallow properly, he couldn't sleep, and he had bouts of heartburn. But he was treated for back pain and stress. Eventually, after a year, he was diagnosed with a condition called Barrett's esophagus. I must admit that I had never heard of it, and Dave, being a typical young man, didn't dwell on it or talk about it very much. But it took 16 months of procedures and recuperation to get Dave back to normal. He's now well, as members know, and has learned to live with his condition. But it is one that has to be regularly monitored. And some months after hearing of Dave's diagnosis, I accidentally tuned into a Radio 4 programme. It was about Barrett's esophagus, and remembering that this was the condition Dave Scott had suffered, I continued to listen. It was only then that I fully understood the nature of the condition Dave Scott had had and the fact that it could be a precursor to esophageal cancer. The radio programme focused on the fact that people with regular problems with reflux or indigestion had a higher disposition to Barrett's and that 30% of those with Barrett's in the UK go on to develop cancer if no intervention takes place. Then earlier this year, I was contacted by a constituent, Mr Daniel McGrory, who had himself suffered from esophageal cancer. He contacted me because he wanted to raise awareness of this particular cancer and particularly of its growing incidence. Above all, and most crucially, he wanted to highlight the lack of awareness that Barrett's esophagus can be a warning, a sign of more serious problems ahead. It is because of Mr McGrory and Dave Scott that we are debating this motion today. And I would like to welcome both of them and some of Mr McGrory's friends to the chamber. Both of his friends, people who, like him, have suffered this particular cancer. Presiding officer, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus has increased globally, but particularly in the UK. In Scotland, it has doubled in the last 10 years and now has an incidence rate. Happy to. Minister. Um, I thank uh, um, Patricia Ferguson for taking this motion to the Chamber, but the National Health, Public Health and Intelligence have confirmed that during the last 10 years, world age standardised incident rates of esophageal adenocarcinoma in Scotland have increased from 4.1 per 100,000 to 4.4 per 100,000. So that hasn't really doubled in the last 10 years. Patricia Ferguson. Well, <laughs> it's very interesting that the Minister should say that because I would challenge her figure because my understanding is that the incidence is now 16.9 per 1,000, which I was just about to say. And clinicians have told me that it's the fifth most common cancer in Scotland and the third most common cause of cancer deaths. And Scotland now has the unenviable record of being the global leader for incidence of the disease. Now, when Mr McGrory first had difficulty swallowing, he thought little of it and delayed going to his GP for four months because his symptoms at first seemed relatively minor. He was lucky and with the skill of his surgeon, 
major surgery and chemotherapy, he has made very good progress. But like most cancers, adenocarcinoma is best treated early and, importantly, has, in this case, a recognisable precursor, Barrett's esophagus. But the charity Ocher tells us that many people with this particular cancer are diagnosed too late for effective intervention. Barrett's is the type of condition which creeps up on people. GPs often struggle to spot the warning signs and over-the-counter indigestion tablets mask the symptoms. In the case of Dave Scott, the patient was prescribed in good faith ibuprofen for what both he and his daughter, doctor thought was a muscular problem. And the reality is that ibuprofen can aggravate Barrett's, making the prognosis more difficult. So what do I want to achieve from this debate? Well, I want to ask the Minister to consider three things. And whether we agree or not on the statistics, the fact of the matter is that, in my view, we should consider making Barrett's, or if not Barrett's, high-grade dysplasia, considered as a condition which merits consideration as a quality performance indicator in the health service. And I would also like to see a campaign to raise awareness of Barrett's and the fact that heartburn can be a sign of more serious problems, something that I'm sure most people don't appreciate. And I would also hope that the Scottish Government could alert those who sell over-the-counter remedies that they should do, as they do with headache tablets, suggest to people buying more than one packet of an indigestion remedy that perhaps they should consult their GP. Now, it seems to me that if Scotland has the unenviable lead in incidence of these conditions, that we should lead the way in the campaign against them too. There is absolutely no doubt that people are dying needlessly just because they don't know the signs of this cancer. Diagnosing Barrett's can prevent esophageal cancer developing and avoids major invasive surgery at a great cost to the NHS and at great disruption to people's lives and families. I've made three very straightforward requests of the Minister in this debate. I very much hope that she will consider those uh, in her response and that she will agree with me that the time has come for Scotland to act on these conditions. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes or so, please. And I call Dr Richard Simpson to be followed by Bob Doris. Can I thank the Deputy Presiding Officer for taking me early and also apologise to members that I have to leave after making my speech. But can I congratulate Patricia Ferguson on getting this debate. It is an important area. It is not straightforward. It is a difficult area. Uh, and there has been much debate about Barrett's esophagus over many years. Some gastroenterologists are still sceptical about the value of GPs referring persistent heartburn patients for endoscopy, partly because the risks of Barrett's esophagus have been previously regarded as low, which they are when there is no dysplasia, that is, alteration of the cells present. But the trouble is that one does not know until the endoscopy or biopsy has been done actually what the situation is. Is it in, in, indefinite? Uh, 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 is it require an indefinite follow-up, which we're not sure about, for uh, uh, very mild dysplasia or no dysplasia at all, just that the Barrett's esophagus being present. Uh, when there's low-grade dysplasia, uh, there is a significant increase in risk, 5.3% in one to eight years. With high-grade dysplasia, there's a 50% risk of adenocarcinoma in one to eight years. Deputy Presiding Officer, I should declare a very personal interest in this, as this is the cancer from which I suffered. Not because of Barrett's esophagus, actually just straightforward esophageal cancer. I was very lucky in that, first of all, having been a doctor, I was aware of the fact that difficulty in swallowing uh, was something that you should not have. Even at my age, where swallowing, if you particularly if you eat rapidly, as I always did as a junior doctor, and learnt to do so, unfortunately, very bad habits. Nevertheless, Difficulty in swallowing is not something that you should experience. And we should send a very clear message out and we should do a lot of public education about the fact that if someone experiences difficulty in swallowing on more than one occasion, they should consult the doctor. They would then hopefully be lucky enough to have this recognised by their GP as a cardinal symptom requiring immediate referral. I was seen within a week. I was diagnosed with endoscopy after one week. 
and I was then subjected to some five, six weeks of tests before I could actually enter treatment. And the reasons for that are that once you enter treatment with esophageal for, for treatment of esophageal cancer, they actually undertake tests to see that there hasn't been spread local or, or distant. There haven't been uh, seeding into, into the abdomen. Um, and they also want to know how thick, how far through the thickness of the, of the gullet, of the food pipe, uh, the cancer has spread. And only once you pass these five tests will you now be subject to uh, preoperative chemotherapy, major surgery as I was, and then postoperative chemotherapy, none of which is a particularly pleasant experience. But nevertheless, it does mean that those who go through it, uh, because they've passed all the tests, do have a much higher level of survival. Overall, however, because of late diagnosis, and because in my view, we are not, uh, we are not following up people with Barrett's esophagus appropriately, and indeed we are not tackling people with chronic heartburn to diagnose that Barrett's esophagus, we have a situation in which the five-year survival of this condition is only 15%. That compares roughly with lung cancer as being amongst the worst survival rates that we have. If, if you take breast cancer, for, for example, now we have 90, 90 plus percent of survival rate because we've tackled it, we're dealing with it extremely well. So I agree with Patricia Ferguson very strongly that this is a, this is a condition in which we need more publicity. Uh, we need to uh, ensure with the pressure on endoscopy services, which are immense, that we have an adequate number of endoscopists. And I'll finish on this note. In 1990, I went to the States because I was doing a joint research project with the Mayo Clinic, and I was fortunate to see some of the work that the Mayo Clinic was doing. They did not restrict endoscopy to only people who were trained doctors and uh, gastroenterologists. They had trained technical nurses who did the endoscopies. Now, we need that in this country. We do have it. And in fact, uh, uh, Dr. Gordon Binney in Fife, when I came back, I suggested to the Fife Health Board and to Forth Valley that they take this up. Forth Valley declined, but uh, Fife took it up, and they have a, a series of, of, of nurse endoscopists. And I'm sure the minister will tell us that there is actually an endoscopy service run there now, which actually gives its service out to other boards. All boards should be having these technical endoscopists. We are going to need many more of them if this particular problem is going to be tackled. So can I thank Patricia Ferguson again for giving me the opportunity and apologize for my early departure. Thank you. And I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Nanette Mill. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I start by uh, congratulating Patricia Ferguson for securing this evening's debate and for, just importantly, drawing attention to a condition that I had heard of, but that was as far as it went. I knew it existed, but beyond that, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you anything else. But I did find the information provided by the Barrett's Esophagus campaign in a 2014 booklet that was made available to, to members before this debate. I found it very enlightening, but I also found it very challenging in public health terms. And I had no idea until earlier on today that Dave Scott had uh, suffered from, or does suffer from, Barrett's esophagus, and uh, I welcome to the chamber today. It's good to see him, and good to see him looking well. And I don't know Mr McGrory, but I, I hope um, things are going well for, for, for him as well. And I'm, I'm very grateful they, they're uh, lending their weight to draw attention to, to this situation as well. And I commend them both for, for doing that. Uh, to think that the suffering from persistent heartburn could be a sign of something far more sinister lurking in terms of your health is clearly worrying. Indeed, I'm, I'm not sure if I would have thought of anything untoward um, for me if I was getting some persistent heartburn. I suspect a lot of men of a certain age, particularly in West Central Scotland, would uh, just shrug it off, thinking it's a, it's a lifestyle choice issue. You know, one curry too many, out having a, a night too much the night before. I see Hans Allah Malik responds to that in relation to his lifestyle. Yes, Mr Malik. Hans Ala Malik. Please don't blame the curries for that. <laughs> Thank you. Bob Torres. Uh, um, I've not had my dinner yet, Mr Malik, so thanks for mentioning curries. Um, but the, the serious point is a lot of us will just shrug it off and think, well, th th there's nothing untoward. And shrugging off the symptoms and ignoring the signs, I think that's the serious point. We're a bit of levity, but that's the serious point I think we're all trying to, to make today. Uh, and it can reasonably um, be agreed that 
given that Barrett's esophagus, as we've heard, is a precancerous condition, early detection and diagnosis fits in very well, actually, with the Scottish Government's Detect Cancer Early initiatives and strategies, and they have been, been highly successful. And I just want to illustrate very briefly some of those successes to make a, a more general point. Uh, with the Detect Cancer Early initiative backed up with uh, £30 million of, of government funding, Nearly 25% of all breast, bowel and lung cancers in, in 2012 and 2013 were detected at the, various early, the very earliest opportunity for action to be taken and there have the best survival and full recovery rates where possible, and that's vital. Now, I don't know where Barrett's esophagus fits in to all of that in terms of early detection. I don't know if the Detect Cancer Early Initiative uh, fits into that strategy or not. I merely put on record that when you hear some of the information you get today, there could be clever ways of having a strategy which picks up some of this in public funds that already exist, under pressured public funds, and we have to prioritise. And I genuinely don't know if Barrett's esophagus is, 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 is the right priority in relation to the Cancer Early Initiative, but we should surely at least check to see if it is. I think that's the point I would make. And likewise, I don't know if quality performance indicators will drive change. It might. The motion says consider it. It doesn't say it will drive change. So, of course, we should consider it. But the important thing is, whatever the best way to get the outcomes that we all want to see, it doesn't matter um, whether there's five different options available. Test each of the options and work out what the best option is to drive change that we all want to see. final thing I'd like to say, just in terms of um, getting the message out there, as we were talking about um, getting information and awareness, I would like to think maybe community pharmacies get quite a significant role in this in terms of people with minor injuries and ailments pitching up uh, to the chemist and saying, oh, I need something for heartburn or whatever. So as they're getting the key information to the key professionals at key times, where actually the people who suffer from this condition are more likely to listen to and interact with. Final, final thing. I know I'm indulging your patience here, but I'm just wondering if there's a health inequality issue here in terms of this does befall men more than women, I have no idea, or certain ages, but we need the data and the information to decide the best way to target. So I thank Patricia Ferguson again for bringing this, in, this debate forward to the Parliament, and I'm keen to work collegiately across party uh, to, to see if we can drive change in this area. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Nanette Millen to be followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank Patricia Ferguson for tabling this motion and for bringing it to the Chamber this evening. Having spent some years doing fact-finding research, mainly in gynaecological cancers, I'm very aware of the increasing incidence of many cancers, but I wasn't aware of the prevalence of esophageal adenocarcinoma and the growing number of people suffering from it in Scotland, nor of the fact that we are the country with the most cases of it. Indeed, at the time I was working, this increased incidence was not foreseen. In general, the number of people diagnosed with one or other form of cancer is rising year after year in the UK. This can in part be explained by an ever-aging population and increased life expectancy, but that's obviously not the only cause of the greater number of people diagnosed with this un unwelcoming and, un and life-threatening illness. When we look at the specific case of the precancerous condition Barrett's esophagus, um, we, we learn that a combination of factors is thought to increase susceptibility to this condition and ensuing esophageal cancer, such as smoking, poor diet, physical inactivity, obesity, excessive alcohol drinking, and eating spicy foods. But that cannot be the whole story, because I know several people who have undergone treatment for esophageal cancer, some successfully and some not, whose lifestyle has included none of these contributory factors. Barrett's esophagus need not inevitably lead to esophageal cancer. And as the motion states, we need to ensure that it's diagnosed early so that it doesn't progress to full-blown cancer. In preparing for this debate, I came across a very moving account of a young lady who was aged only 19, one of the youngest people in the UK to be diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus. Her story started in February 2010, when she sat down as normal for her breakfast cereal, but found it incredibly painful to swallow. Afterwards, she found it increasingly difficult to eat, and her weight dropped from 13 stones down to 7 stone. She was told by her GP she was either anorexic or bulimic, but neither diagnosis, of course, was correct. Her GP recommended counselling, but it was only after she woke one morning gasping for air and being rushed to A to E that she was finally told she had Barrett's esophagus. 
That was two years after she'd experienced her first symptoms, by which time there was a large cancerous tumour blocking her esophagus. She then had to go through a prolonged period of chemotherapy. Thankfully, she has now fully recovered. But I go back to my initial point that early diagnosis and detection has to be a priority when we're dealing with this condition. We therefore need a better understanding of Barrett's esophagus and must train those in the medical profession that this can be a life-threatening matter if not discovered early. Heartburn is a very common symptom, which is usually ignored by us and treated with antacids or other remedies readily available from local pharmacies. But the Ocher charity, which exists to promote awareness of esophageal cancer, stresses that people should understand that heartburn isn't okay, certainly when it occurs frequently, and to find out what's causing it by making a doctor's appointment, not a trip to the chemist. Ocher is working with partners across the UK and Ireland to take action against heartburn, and has agreed to fund specialist research at Queen's University Belfast to look at biomarkers associated with, associated with esophageal cancer risk and early diagnosis using data from the UK Biobank. Hopefully this will lead to a better understanding of the causes of this, this uh, cancer. In members' debates, we tend not to be critical of different parties or the Scottish Government. However, in reply to five questions asked of the then Health Secretary Nicola Sturgeon regarding Barrett's esophagus, the replies were less than satisfactory. There is no central information regarding the number of people in Scotland who have this condition, and there has been no specific action plan to raise awareness among the general public regarding Barrett's esophagus. Perhaps the Minister could address these points in her contribution to this evening's important debate, because there clearly is a need to know the incidence of Barrett's esophagus in Scotland and to follow up those who have it so that an early diagnosis can be made if it appears to be leading to the development of a, of a malignancy. So once again, my thanks to Patricia Ferguson for tabling the motion. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also congratulate Patricia Ferguson to bringing this issue to the attention of Parliament uh, and highlighting the issue of esophageal cancer in Scotland, a condition for which mortality is higher than the other nations of the UK, and the relationship between the condition Barrett's esophagus and the development of some esophageal cancers in some patients. Only two weeks ago, I highlighted the plight of my constituent, Brian Houliston, who suffers from esophageal cancer and secondary liver cancer. At that time, he had been refused NHS treatment for selective internal radiation therapy, the second part of a treatment recommended to him by Harley Street Specialist, which can be accessed in England and Wales, where trials of a combined course of a specialist chemotherapy and SIRT are being researched. The good news, I have to say, in Brian's case is that uh, the Saturday after it was raised in Parliament, he received a letter advising him that NHS Dumfries and Galloway had considered his appeal and agreed to fund his SIRT, so long as it was as, as administered as part of the trials being undertaken in Edinburgh and contributing, sorry, in England, uh, and contributing to research on the development of these cancers. So I was del delighted to receive a copy from Brian and Shona, his wife, and wish him all the best in his treatment. But one of the important things that Brian told me when he came over to Holyrood to hear my question to the health secretary was that he hadn't got any symptoms with his esophageal cancer. And it was actually, I think, the secondary cancer which had alerted him to the health problem. I think the success of this sometimes actually says that sometimes we do achieve some success in here. I think maybe we all wonder whether we're really doing anything, but there are times when we feel we achieve some success for, for our constituents. And in Brian's case, I know that it probably won't save his life, but it'll probably mean he has a bit more time with his family. And I think that's important too. Esophageal cancer can often be asymptomatic until it is seriously progressed and possibly by then untreatable, which is why the recognition of the connection of some esophageal cancers with the condition Barrett's esophagus is so important. But until Patricia Ferguson submitted this motion to Parliament, I was unaware of the condition Barrett's esophagus, uh, which is uh, advised about, uh, us about, and the change to the cells in the affected area of the esophagus, which can be caused by things like um, uh, uh, heartburn. Now, I was well aware that there is a link between uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, I think it's called, and esophageal cancer, because actually I've suffered from GORD for a long time and I'd looked it up. Uh, uh, in my case, I think there's a genetic component because my, my children also have 
have a tendency towards this as well. But I have to say, three pregnancies in five years, getting older and fatter, and the sort of lifestyle that we have in here, you know, eating and working, eating a huge rate of knots, made it considerably worse. Uh, but I never, I have never ever attended the GP about it. I just live off Gaviscon and other such things. My, two of my, my children, however, were less... Uh, scared, I think, uh, and went to see their doctor and pre prescribed omeprazole. My daughter actually says it makes her feel as if she has flu, so she doesn't actually take it, but um, they, they were a bit braver. Than it was. One of the interesting things is that actually when I eventually decided that being the same weight as I was when I was nine months pregnant was, was a bit shocking and went on a diet, I actually found that the, the gastroesophageal reflux disease got a bit better, and I don't know whether that's because of loss of weight or whether that's because I wasn't eating as much carbs and, and fats, which my daughter reckons actually are partly you know, uh, responsible for, for the heartburn condition. But it is still possible that I could have Barrett's esophagus. It is actually still possible, having had that for so many years. And now that I've been alerted to the condition by Patricia Ferguson's motion, and knowing also of Dr Simpson's terrible experiences as, a, as somebody who actually suffered from esophageal uh, cancer, I guess I should desist from my normal practice of GP avoidance, and Bob Doris says it's men. I'm afraid Scottish women aren't always all that good at going to the doctor either. Uh, and I probably ought to get it checked out, and if me saying that I will actually resolve to do that and get it checked out makes anybody else think, yes, I ought to go to the doctor and get it checked out, uh, I hope that they will do the same, and I hope actually that I am brave enough to go and see my doctor about it. Thank you very much. Can I now invite Maureen Watt to respond to the debate minister? Seven minutes or so, please. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. And I'd like to also thank Patricia Ferguson for raising this motion and bringing both esophageal adenocarcinoma and Barrett's esophagus to the attention of this parliament. And can I also recognise Dave Scott and Mr McCrory and their friends and family in the gallery and also thank members for their contributions, especially that was last one, Elaine Murray's uh, personal um, testimony about the need to get checked. I'm sure that everyone in the chamber will agree that we must do everything we can to reduce the numbers of people who develop cancer and to give those who do develop the disease the best chance of surviving to live a full and healthy life after treatment. But I do feel that the two that the two factual inaccuracies in the motion should be noted for the record. The motion does suggest that the incidence of esophageal adenocarcinoma in Scotland has doubled in the last 10 years. And as I said, this is not correct. NHS Public Health and Intelligence have confirmed that between 2003 and 13, world age standardized incident rates of esophageal adenocarcinoma in Scotland have increased from 4.1 per 100,000 to 4.4 per 100,000, and that doesn't represent a doubling of the rate of incidence. Although rates of adenocarcinoma increased quite steeply in the early 1990s, rates have plateaued more recently, which is an encouraging trend, and I'd be happy to make the, this data available to Patricia Ferguson if that would be helpful. The motion also asks this Parliament to note that the NHS in England records Barrett's esophagus as a quality performance indicator, a QPI, to allow diagnostic progress to be monitored. This is also not correct. England doesn't record Barrett's esophagus as a QPI. In fact, England doesn't have a direct equivalent to our QPIs. However, it is true that Scotland, along with the rest of the UK, had a generally higher rate of incidence than many comparable countries. So although it's important to correct these inaccuracies, nevertheless, I agree with the essential point being made in the motion that we need to reduce the numbers of people who develop esophageal cancer and increase the number of people who survive it. If we are to reduce... Yep. Hans Alamalik. Uh, thank you and good evening, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for taking an intervention. I'm wondering whether the Minister would consider uh, Dr Richard Simpson's uh, um, suggestion that we allow nurses to be trained in other health authorities, which might help uh, reach the conclusion that you were wanting to reach. It would be a softer expenditure, but a very good result. Minister. I thank Hans Alan Malik for his intervention. I think the points that both uh, Patricia Ferguson made in introducing the motion and Dr Richard Simpson about increasing awareness 
throughout the medical profession, and especially the point that Patricia Ferguson made about uh, raising the um, awareness among pharmacists, especially if you have people repeatedly coming in um, for uh, heartburn uh, remedies, that they should perhaps be pointing out to, the, uh, to those people that they should be perhaps uh, looking for further investigation. So if we are re to reduce the number of people who develop cancer, then changing our lifestyle choices is essential. And there is clear evidence that smoking, diet and obesity are significant risk factors for both Barrett's and esophageal adenocarcinoma, as well, or as well as for many other conditions. And we are working hard to raise, raise awareness of these links. Um, as members know, it's the Scottish Government's aim to reduce smoking prevalence to 5% of the population by 2034, making Scotland one of the first countries in the world to set such an ambitious target. Our tobacco control strategy focuses on supporting the introduction of standardised packaging and education programmes to prevent young people from starting to smoke, on reducing the health inequalities inherent in smoking, on improving smoking cessation services and on supporting pregnant women to quit. We're also working to address obesity in Scotland, making it easier for people to become more active, to eat less and to eat better. Our obesity framework sets out both the national and local government's respective long-term commitments to tackle overweight and obesity. I absolutely agree with the motion that early detection improves survival rates for many cancers. And since, since February 2012, we've invested 39 million in the Detect Cancer Early Programme, which aims to raise awareness of the symptoms and signs of ca cancer. And the main message is that people should visit their GP if they experience any unusual or persistent changes in their body or health. We have revised our guidelines for GPs to help them refer people to specialists where this is appropriate. Investigations which then take place will help to identify precancerous conditions such as Barrett's esophagus as well as cancer. It's worth noting that esophageal cancer represents 3% of cancers and thankfully not everyone who has Barrett's esophagus will develop esophageal adenocarcinoma. In mm -hmm. Patricia Ferguson. I'm grateful to the Minister for taking an intervention. And um, while I understand that there is a great focus on detecting cancer early, it's clear that even we who debate these issues are not always familiar with issues like Barrett's esophagus. And if you consider that the incidence in Scotland of Barrett's esophagus progressing to become esophageal cancer is five times higher than a relatively similar sized country like Denmark, then isn't now the time to do something specific about Barrett's? Minister? Well, I was going on to say that, in fact, it is estimated by Cancer Research UK that only one in every 860 people with Barrett's will go on to develop esophageal adenocarcinoma each year. However, I also recognise that the effect of our diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus uh, and agree that we must do all we can to detect and treat the condition effectively. And yes, you know, as I said earlier, medical, the medical profession should be aware of this condition and how to treat it uh, properly. And raising awareness uh, among all these professionals is absolutely vital. And where Barrett's is diagnosed, I do expect the clinicians to be aware of the relevant NICE and other professional guidelines around monitoring and, if necessary, treatment of this condition. The motion mentions the QPIs and in Scotland we have developed cancer QPIs to drive forward improvement in cancer care in Scotland. Our performance against these indicators is measured and reported publicly on a three-year basis. The first QPI report for esophageal gastric cancers was published in February 2015 and showed that the service in Scotland is generally good but there is always room for improvement. The clinical specialist group who developed the QPI carefully considered whether a measure should be included for Barrett's esophagus. The group considered that such a measure would not be appropriate at this time. However, QPIs are continuously reviewed against evolving evidence and clinical practice, and the need and practicality of such a measure will be monitored by the review group. 
I would therefore like to conclude by emphasising that we recognise the importance of awareness and early detection, improving survival, cancer survival rates, and we we'll continue to focus our efforts in these areas. And I congratulate the charity Opera in raising awareness. And can I thank again Patricia Ferguson for raising awareness of this condition? Many thanks, and that concludes Patricia Ferguson's debate on the importance of recognising the condition Barrett's oesophagus. And I now close this meeting of Parliament.